Chapter 6 After supper, the whole family gathered in the living room, and they simply talked for a few minutes. Bob filled Wyatt, Cade, and the girls in on their plan for Jim to talk to the foals. It was Ted's idea. I don't know if it'll work, but Jim's game, so we'll give it a try in the stable in the morning, while we're all there. Joy frowned. I have my interview in the morning, so I won't be able to be there. She wanted to be part of it when he communicated with the foals. It felt like she was missing out on something major. All eyes were on her, and she felt uncomfortable for a moment. Jim covered her hand with his. We'll let you know how it goes as soon as you get back. Sounds good, Joy said. She wanted to be there, but she understood not putting it off longer for someone who wasn't really even part of the family. Yet. Griselda popped into the room with cupcakes on a plate, carefully handing the red one to Deck. Everyone else got lemon with lemon frosting, and Joy bit into hers with a moan. Griselda, you're a cupcake genius. Deck frowned at his red cupcake for a moment, before biting into it. No one said anything about the oddly colored cupcake, but it seemed strange to Joy that Griselda had made such a production of giving him the different one. Once the cupcakes were finished, Joy went to the kitchen to get another lemonade. I don't know what Tessa puts into this stuff, but I want to drink it every minute of every day for the rest of my life. Probably a secret potion or something. Griselda shrugged. Lots of people slip secret things into food and drinks, always for the other person's good, of course. Joy frowned at Griselda, before deciding she was just being odd like Pops was. She carried her glass into the living room to see everyone going their separate ways. She walked to Jim and sat beside him on the couch, not sure if he intended to stay or go, but she was happy to sit close to him regardless. Pops eyed Jim. You should take her for a walk. Or to a movie in town. Jim looked over at Joy. Walk or movie? Walk and movie? We'll walk to my house and watch a movie there then, he said, grinning at her. Pops frowned. I want you to pretend I'm sitting between you the whole time. You hear me, boy? That girl needs to come back to me tonight as chaste as she is sitting there beside you. Joy blushed, having no idea how chaste Pops thought she was. I think we should go now. Jim laughed. Me too. She had her lemonade in one hand and her other held his as they headed across the ranch. Do you live close to Bob? I can really only see the stables from their house. Apparently, the ranch was huge, and there were houses all over it that couldn't be seen from one to the next. No, all the houses are spread out across the ranch. Until Kate got married, he and Deck shared the house their parents built. Bob had a small house built for himself, and that's where he and Tessa live. Deck staked out an area where he wanted to build a house when we were teenagers, and now that he's not living with Cade, he's talking about finally building it. And the house I live in is where my parents lived with us until they died when they were in a gas explosion. A gas explosion? That didn't make sense. He told her his parents died while mountain climbing in Peru. How odd. I can't wait to see your house. You'll love it. I moved there when I was 18. I had no intention of going to college, and my brothers did, so I got first pick of places to live. It needs some updating, but it has a great structure. I've redone the kitchen, but that's it so far. He hoped she'd want to help him with the updates. Do you cook? she asked. It would be tricky without being able to read recipes, but from what she'd seen of him, he could conquer anything. I do. I don't bake, but I cook a lot. I enjoy it. Awesome. I don't mind cooking, but it's not my favorite. She shrugged. I make a couple of meals, and I do like to bake. Well, then I'll cook most of the time, and you can do dishes. Fair trade, she said. For some reason she'd always preferred cleaning to cooking. When they got to his house, he showed her around the downstairs. The bedrooms are up, 
but I think Pops would skin me alive if he thought I got you anywhere close to any bed. She laughed. He is certainly playing the overprotective grandfather. I'm not even sure what to think of him. I like him, but this is kind of strange. I really don't know what to think either. He's kind of gone overboard with it, but whatever. He sat down on the couch in front of a large screen TV. The dining room bordered on the living room, and then she could see the kitchen beyond that. What do you want to watch? She shrugged. I don't know. I thought you'd have something in mind. More than anything, she wanted to sit beside him and snuggle. He frowned. Let me think. Do you like action movies? She shook her head. Not really. They make me tense. Hmm, I'm not really into romantic movies. I like funny. Do you like funny? Hopefully, they would both enjoy some of the same movies. I love funny. Funny movies make the world go round. How would you feel about Shazam? There's some action of course, but the movie is hilarious. He'd seen it with Bob when it had first come out. Joy nodded. I haven't seen that yet, and I've wanted to. Sounds perfect. Jim spoke, telling his TV to buy Shazam from an online streaming company. There. She smiled at his way to watch movies without having to navigate through his smart TV, impressed that he'd managed yet again. As they watched the movie, she sat snuggled against him with his arm around her. She was so aware of him that she barely noticed what was happening on the screen, but she couldn't complain. He made her heart beat faster, and she wanted to spend forever with him. As a psychologist, she would warn anyone against marrying someone they knew so little about, but it made sense to her at that moment. After the movie, of which she remembered nothing, she rinsed out the glass she'd taken from the big house. I had fun tonight. Got my mind off my nerves about the interview tomorrow. Good. Jim stroked her cheek. I think it's going to go really well. I sure hope so. She wanted to have a job set there so she could marry him and not have to worry about finding something else. They were halfway back to the big house when Jim stopped walking and pulled Joy to him. Can't risk Pop seeing us kiss. He'll make me start coughing up the cows now. The mental image of coughing up cows is not a pretty one, but I like the idea of kissing. She wrapped her arms around his neck, ready for the smooching to start. He grinned. Can I ask you one question first? Joy nodded. Sure, but hurry. I'm waiting for my kiss. He dug the ring box out of his pocket and dropped to one knee, holding it up for her. Joy, I know we haven't known one another a long time, but apparently in my family that no longer matters. I think you're the most amazing woman I've ever met in my life, and I want to spend forever with you. Will you marry me? Joy's hand went to cover her mouth. She truly hadn't expected him to ask until after her interview the next day. Nodding emphatically, she said, yes. But don't forget to pay your pops his cows. Jim laughed, getting to his feet and slipping the ring onto her finger. He was looking forever right in the face, and his heart was full. He pulled her to him and kissed her softly. When? When? Joy's mind raced. Um, well, I have to interview tomorrow. Could we set a date after that? She was already overwhelmed at the idea of planning a wedding. She'd never wanted the big white wedding with all the thrills. She was more of a fifteen people at the wedding, and then a big party, after kind of girl. Do you want a big wedding? he asked. She shook her head emphatically. I don't. Do you? No. I just want Griselda to play the piano, and Pops to walk you down the aisle. What about Tuesday or Wednesday? He said a silent prayer, she'd agree to a quick wedding, because he didn't want to wait. She'd agreed to be his, and he was ready to start their lives together. That's fast. Can you arrange the cow transfer so quickly? Joy asked, her eyes wide. 
Ted can. He can do anything. Tuesday? Joy nodded. But I want both Tessa and Jamie to stand up with me. Would that be all right? Jim nodded. I'll have Bob and Ted. He drew her to him and kissed her, his hands roaming over her back. I wish we didn't have to wait even that long. He wanted to take her home with him right then. Pops wouldn't be happy if we anticipated our vows. And honestly, neither would I. I guess I'm an old-fashioned girl with old-fashioned morals. Works for me. I only have to wait two days. If I can't handle that, then I'm no better than an animal. He thought about what Starlight had asked him about watching when they mated, and pushed the thought out of his mind. He could just imagine how Joy would react to the question. I'd better get back to the big house then. I have to sleep, interview, and plan a wedding between now and Tuesday. She paused for a moment, resting her forehead against his shoulder. And I need to find time to kiss you too. That's kind of important. Kind of, he asked. It's incredibly important. Joy laughed, loving the idea of marrying this man and spending forever with him. Jim fought a silent battle with himself about telling her that he couldn't read, but he decided it could wait until after the wedding. No need to frighten her away. Besides, she hadn't asked if he could read, so technically he wasn't lying to her. He just wasn't telling her his biggest secret as of yet. Pops was waiting up for them when they arrived back at the big house, and Joy showed him her ring. I'm so happy for both of you. Pops got to his feet and hugged them both. When is the wedding? We're thinking Tuesday, Jim told his grandfather. As long as those cows are in my possession before then, I'm fine with that. You know, Pops, you're not really related to her. You're related to me. Why do you think you need cows? Pops shook his head. I have one granddaughter, and you're not taking the privilege of marrying her off away from me. I'm giving you away, Joy. Joy smiled, nodding. I'm going to call my parents first thing in the morning. I doubt they'll be able to come for the wedding so quickly, but I have to give them the option. If my dad is here, you can both give me away. There was no way she was ruining the old man's fun. I suppose I can share you with your father for a bit, Pops said magnanimously. Joy kissed Pops' cheek, before kissing Jim's. I'll see you both tomorrow. As Jim watched her walk away, he couldn't stop thinking about her and how wonderful she was. And she was going to be his wife. I can't believe she actually agreed to marry me. I can't either. She's too good for you, boy, and don't you forget it. Jim laughed. I won't, Pops. I promise. As he walked back toward his house, he was elated to know that in just two days, joy would be his. His joy. Life couldn't possibly get better than it was at that moment. Asterisk. First thing Monday morning, joy called her mother. Hey, Mom. How's your trip? Are you enjoying yourself? Did you interview for that job yet? Joy laughed. Her mother had a habit of asking all the questions she needed answers to all at once, and then waiting for her replies. Sometimes it was annoying, but at that moment, she liked it. I'll interview in a couple of hours. Trip is amazing. The views here, you would be in your very own paradise in the middle of all these mountains. I'm having a lot of fun, and I'm getting married tomorrow. To Tessa's brother-in-law. What? You can't marry someone your father and I haven't even met. Mom, truly, there's nothing to worry about. Jim is amazing. He works for his family's ranch training horses, and he's really good at his job. He treats me like a princess. Do you think you guys could make it here for the wedding? I'm guessing no, but if you're not here, we'll make sure to have a reception in a couple of months when it would be easier for you to come. Her mother sighed. Your dad has his cardiologist appointment tomorrow. We can't miss that. The doctor is so busy it takes months to get into him. If you do a reception, we'll be there, 
go. Thanks, Mom. We'll try to plan one for maybe September. Does that work? It'll give us time to plan something fun. And for Moonbeam to have her foals. Joy wanted to laugh at herself. She never thought she'd be planning social events around a mare giving birth. That does work. Her mother was quiet for a moment, and Joy instinctively knew she was crying. I'll go ahead and hire a mover for your things. I'm going to miss you. Joy sucked in a breath. I'll miss you too, Mom. Jim makes me happy, though. She wished there was a way to convince her mother that all would be well, but it would be difficult until her mother met Jim. Jim and Joy. Yes, I guess your names even go together. Be happy. I will. You still have the address I gave you to send my things to? She'd given her Tessa's address, but it would work. I do. And I'll UPS the boxes you marked as the most important so they're there sooner. Thanks. I love you. Joy hung up, and she dashed tears away from her eyes. She'd been away from her parents for both college and grad school, but she'd always known she was going home. This time, she wasn't. Tessa drove her to town for the interview, thrilled to be back behind the wheel of her own car. I'm going to grocery shop. Just message me when you and Mr. Downey are finished, and I'll come get you. You're going to love him. He's everything that Keith isn't. Keith was their former principal and Tessa's old boyfriend who was now marrying Tessa's sister, Lindsay. Both of them were glad to be away from Keith. Good. I couldn't work for another man like Keith. Joy looked at the school as Tessa pulled up in front of it. This is K-8? Yup. Just like our school in Illinois. Get in there and kill the interview, and then we'll grab Jamie and spend the rest of the day planning your wedding. There's not much to plan, there was no time to plan anything, so why bother? Tessa grinned. We'll think of something. Good luck. Joy took a deep breath and got out of the car. She was wearing her favorite dress, and she was more nervous than she'd thought she would be. The job was perfect for her, and she really wanted to do well. Walking into the building, she saw that the main office was off to the right, and she stepped into it. There was a secretary sitting at the counter, and she smiled. Are you Tessa's friend? About the counseling job? The secretary licked her fingers and raised them to the sky. Was she doing that simply because Tessa had been mentioned? Tessa had married a triplet, and now she was bad luck too? Joy nodded. I am. You must be Brandy. Tessa told me to talk to you. Yup, when Joy said Tessa's name, Brandy did the finger-licking thing again. What a strange town. Brandy nodded. Yeah, I'm the secretary here. Have a seat, and I'll see if Mr. Downey is ready for you. Joy sat down, looking at the happy posters on the walls. This place already had a happier feel than their old school had. Hopefully the principal would be as wonderful as Tessa thought he was. Brandy was back a second later with an older man. This is Joy Nelson. Mr. Downey smiled, and he shook her hand. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Downey. Tessa has said some really nice things about you and your school. He licked his fingers and raised them. Wonderful. I'm excited to have Tessa working for us. Come to my office, and we'll talk. Joy stood and followed him into his office, immediately at ease sitting there. Thanks for working around my schedule. I wasn't sure how long I'd be able to be here. And now? I'm staying whether I get this job or not. Jim Cauldron and I are getting married tomorrow. Joy was excited to be able to tell him about her impending nuptials, though she was unsure why. He just seemed so fatherly to her. Mr. Downey immediately licked his fingers and raised them to the sky. That's wonderful. The entire valley will be better off with some new blood. From there, he started the interview process, and Joy found it to be relatively painless. She genuinely liked the man. 
When they were finished, he smiled. I've already checked your references, and I'm ready to make you a job offer. He named a figure that was a little less than she'd been making in Illinois, but it was apparent she really didn't need to work if she was married to one of the cauldrons. That sounds wonderful. I'm excited to start working here. It would be fun to start with a new group of kids. She seriously couldn't wait for school to start. Mr. Downey smiled. All right. I have a summer assignment for you, if you'll take it. He explained there was a little girl about to start school there in the fall, who until a couple of weeks before hadn't spoken. I'd like you to work with Abby and get to know her. She's got a terrible history, but I want you to talk to Tessa about that. She's the one the girl has opened up with. Absolutely. Tessa actually dropped me off, so I'll talk to her on our way back to the Cauldron Ranch. Immediately, Mr. Downey licked his fingers and raised them to the sky again. Joy knew what the reason was, if it could be called a reason. It must have been strange with all six boys going to school here, in the same grade, and everyone having to do that whenever they passed them in the halls. Let's just say, we made all the children wash their hands often. You can never be too careful. With you two ladies working here, we'll have to install hand sanitizer stations in the teacher's lounge and maybe even all the classrooms. I think the two of you are worth it though. Joy couldn't help but laugh. You have some odd superstitions around here. If she'd still been going to school, she'd have wanted to write a paper on the superstitions in Cauldron Valley. They fascinated her. I know we do. But we're a lovable group. Welcome to Cauldron Valley. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. And despite their strange traditions and ways, Joy was really happy to be part of the community. As she signed papers for Brandy, she found she was thrilled that the other woman talked to her so freely. Other than the finger licking, of course. Joy was sure that the people in town needed to be in a KFC commercial. Finger licking good. Chapter 7 When Tessa picked Joy up from the school, Joy was thrilled about the new job. Do people ever stop licking their fingers, though? The principal said they'd have to put in new hand sanitizer stations. I've heard this town has runs on hand sanitizer a lot. Hopefully the school can order it from an industrial supply. Tessa shrugged. Okay, let's go to my place, we'll make a couple of kinds of tacos and invite Jamie over for lunch. Then we can all pig out on tacos while we talk about the wedding. The worrisome thing for me is what I'm going to wear. I never really wanted a big wedding, but I always wanted a pretty wedding dress. White with all the beading, you know what I mean. Joy shook her head. Maybe I should just wear one for the reception in September. Tessa frowned. You're slimmer than I am, but maybe we could take my dress in for you. What would you think of wearing that? I love the idea. Within a couple of hours, the three women were sitting around Tessa's kitchen table, discussing wedding plans. How can I have you two dress alike on short notice? Joy asked. I want you both standing up with me. We could drive to Helena and find some dresses that would work, Jamie suggested. They probably wouldn't be traditional bridesmaid dresses, but we'd match. Joy nodded. I could do that. If we had time, I'd make a couple of dresses, but tomorrow gives me no time at all. She frowned, taking the last bite of her taco. You two up for a road trip? Jamie nodded. Sure. I need to do a little shopping anyway. Why not? Tessa sighed. I hate shopping, but I guess shopping with my two besties will be worth it. Right? Yes. Joy was determined that the three of them would have fun as they planned the few details of the wedding they could in just a few hours. Jim would have called the pastor, right? Jamie's eyes lit up. Pastor Dinkelheimler is a nut. I kept saying cauldron and cade and all kinds of things, and he licked his fingers so many times, I thought he was going to wet down the whole church. I probably shouldn't have tormented him that way but it was fun. 
Sounds like a good time to me. Joy grinned at her friends. Shall we head to Helena? After a full day of shopping and interviews, Joy ate supper with Pops, Griselda, Deck, and Ted. She was supposed to see Jim after supper, but she was eating the meal with the people she lived with, and she'd hurry and do some of the sewing she needed to do until Jim arrived. Do you want me to play piano for the ceremony? Griselda asked. Joy hadn't even thought of music. That would be great. I can't believe we're planning this so fast, but it's coming together. She couldn't imagine going through months or even years of planning a wedding, though. It would have made her crazy. Good. Do you have a dress? Griselda asked. Joy nodded. I'm going to wear Tessa's. I have to spend some time tonight taking it in, but it will work for me. Pop smiled at Joy. I can't believe my girl is finally getting married. Ted looked between his grandfather and his brother's future wife. Your girl? You've known her for less than a week, Pops. Get a grip. She's mine as much as you are. So, hush up, Ted. Across the table, Deck hid his chuckle behind his glass as he took a sip of water. When Ted glared at him, he sent his cousin a smirk. Yeah, hush up, Ted. Ted shrugged, obviously not sure what was going on there, but he wasn't going to argue about it any longer. As soon as supper was over, Joy joined Griselda in the kitchen, but Griselda waved her away. You go work on your dress. There'll be plenty of family dinners, and you can help with the dishes, then if you feel like it. Joy nodded. Thank you. I know having another mouth to feed makes your job harder, and I appreciate it. It was strange that she was already feeling close to the hired help of the family she was marrying into. Life was odd in Cauldron Valley. Jim came in the front door then. How are the wedding plans coming? He asked Joy, still surprised she'd agreed to marry him. Good. Griselda is playing piano, and I found dresses for Jamie and Tessa. Now I just need to take in the dress Tessa is loaning me, and I'm set. I'll probably be barefoot though, because her shoes are way too small for me, and I hate shoes. She'd always imagined getting married in her bare feet, so that's what she was going to do. She'd even talked Jamie and Tessa out of wearing shoes. Jim took her hand and led her out to the back porch, where they could be alone, and he could hopefully sneak a kiss. I didn't know you hated shoes. I'm learning more about you every day. Well, since we haven't spent much time together, it makes sense that you would. She sighed. I got the job. She hoped he'd be as thrilled as she was that she already had a job there. I knew you would. When do you start? Mr. Downey has someone he wants me to work with this summer, but I won't really start until a couple of weeks before school begins. Sounds good. Did you like Mr. Downey? Joy nodded emphatically. Though he's a finger licker, and that just feels weird to me. She wished people would just get over licking their fingers and move on. And she hoped she didn't have triplets. She couldn't imagine even more of the finger licking. You'll get used to it. Trust me. I'm sure I will. I don't think I'll ever like it though. So, I set the wedding up for ten in the morning with the pastor. He said we cauldrons are going to have to start paying his salary with all the weddings going on. She smiled at that. How did it go with Moonbeam's foals? I talked to Moonbeam, and she was fine with me trying to talk to the foals, but I couldn't get anything from them. I'll try again, but they may just be too young to communicate that way. I mean, they haven't even been born yet. I can see that would be weird. I'm glad you tried, though. Oh, me too. The other guys were pretty disappointed, but I can't do any more than I can do. Maybe I need another shot of the good water around here. Something had to help, but he had no idea what that would be. Joy smiled. You still think there's something in the water that makes you guys special and able to do strange things like you do? He nodded. I don't know of any better explanation. 
I'm still not sure what I do is really talking to the horses or just me imagining what they'd say based on what I already know about them. I guess that makes sense. She shrugged. I guess it doesn't matter if it's real or not. Not to me anyway. They do what I tell them to do, and that's good enough. Jim had spent a lot of time wondering about the oddities of the Cauldron family, and he just wasn't going to worry about it anymore. Are you taking time off after we marry? Like for a honeymoon? Jim shook his head. I can't until Moonbeam has those babies. I wish I could. I can take most of a day off. After school starts, I can't take time off until Thanksgiving, so, we'll do something then, or over Christmas break. I told my mom that we would have a reception in September so she and dad could be there. Does that work for you? Sure does. I honestly think that's a good plan. We'll still be able to celebrate, but for now, we can keep things low-key. He kissed the top of her head. I really don't feel the need to celebrate our marriage with anyone but you. She laughed. I agree. By September we'll want to have fun though. Definitely. I need to show off my beautiful bride when I get the chance. I'm not planning any wedding cake or anything for tomorrow. Only the actual wedding. She hoped he didn't have anything special in mind for the wedding, because she didn't have any more time to plan anything. Griselda won't let us get away with that, but we can do just cake and run away after the ceremony. He was already trying to think of fun things for them to do during the day. It would be his only real day off for a while. He'd have to make sure to check on Moonbeam though. Joy nodded. Where will the ceremony be? At the church where Bob and Tessa got married. It's also the church we've gone to our entire lives. Works for me, she said. It's hard to believe that in less than 24 hours we'll be married. Jim smiled. I can honestly say that I can't wait. I never thought I'd be this eager to marry, but I am. He had been since the moment he'd seen her at Bob and Tessa's reception. Her flaming red hair had caught his attention, and he'd dreamt about it since. What was it about her hair that fascinated him so? Glad to hear it, Joy said. I wouldn't want you to be dreading it when we're getting married tomorrow. If I was dreading it, we'd have a four-year engagement. Two days is more my style. My mom is going to UPS a few of my things, and hire a mover for the rest. I knew I wasn't going to stay in town, so I packed everything up before I left. I'll just be without a car for a while as we wait on my belongings. Jim nodded. Sounds good. I wish I could say we could fly down and rent a U-Haul, but that's not logical at this point. I really do need to be around Moonbeam. I agree. With as worried about her as everyone is, I think it's best if you stick with her. You're the only one who can speak horse. She knew it was an odd way to put it, but what was a better way? Yup. That's pretty much what everyone else is saying. The other guys talked to me about the possibility of me taking time off today, and we all decided it wasn't reasonable right now. Jim shrugged. While he'd have loved to have time with her, Moonbeam was too important for him to go anywhere. I hope you know I'm fine with that. I wouldn't ask you to put a horse in danger, just so we could have a honeymoon. I appreciate that about you. Joy leaned back on the swing, stretching a little. Tessa, Jamie, and I went into Helena today. We found dresses for them. I know I should have bought shoes to marry in, but the truth is, I don't want them. He chuckled. I don't care if your feet are naked or not. He glanced down at her feet and saw she was shoeless. You have cute toes. Thanks. That's a compliment I've never received but always wanted. Is that so? It is. And now I'll give you a compliment. I'm a sucker for broad shoulders, and yours are the best. The very best in the whole wide world. She turned toward him and ran her hands over his shoulders. Glad you like them. He wasn't really sure how to react to her compliment, but he was pleased she found him attractive. 
I'm also glad I asked you to dance at Bob's reception, because I've thought about you every day since. You have? She wasn't sure if he was telling her the truth, but she wanted to think he was. She'd certainly thought about him every day. He nodded. Yup. You were Tessa's pretty friend, Joy, in my mind. And now I have you here beside me. And the next day, he'd have her under him. I thought about you too. I asked Tessa everything I could about you, hoping she wouldn't say anything to anyone else. She didn't say anything to me. He thought back to the dinner he'd had with his family and how he'd said he would marry the woman who brought joy into his life. Already he'd known that he meant joy. She was just what he needed in his life. Good. I would have felt like an eighth grader passing notes and having my best friend talk to your best friend. He laughed. Well, that wasn't necessary. I'm just thrilled you're here. It seemed like it took forever. For me too. I came as soon as I could after school was out. I gave my resignation as soon as I got back to Illinois from the wedding. I knew then I wanted to be here, and when Tessa told me there was an opening at her school for a counselor, well, I just did what made sense. It was dark already, but she looked out over the mountains there. This is such a beautiful place to live. I never dreamed I'd live anywhere but corn country. Corn country? Sure. Everywhere you look in Illinois is corn. Well, not in Chicago, but real people don't live in the big city. We live in rural towns, and that's where the corn lives. Miles and miles of corn for as far as the eye can see. I need to visit your Illinois soon. Maybe we can do that next summer. He liked the idea of seeing where she'd grown up. I'd like that. I'm glad you'll meet my parents before that though. They're going to love you. Her parents were easy. If he made her happy, they would love her. It was that simple. I sure hope so. I'm awfully lovable. She laughed, turning toward him and kissing him. I sure think so. I'm keeping you. You don't have a choice anymore. Asterisk. Tessa, Jamie, and Joy got ready for the wedding in the same room at the back of the church Tessa had used to get ready just weeks before. Joy hoped that no one had really been invited other than family, but she wasn't sure what was going to happen. Pops had made it clear that he was giving her away, and he didn't care what she thought about it. Joy knew that Griselda had brought a cake to the church, and she was ready to taste more of the woman's delicious concoctions. Hopefully it would be more lemon cake. That would make her happy. She stood in front of a mirror, looking at a stranger. Tessa had taken the time to straighten her hair for her, which Joy considered too much trouble. It hung down her back, and with as much as Jim loved her hair, she knew he would be pleased. Her toes peeked out from under the dress, but she was thrilled not to have to wear shoes. The three of them had gotten pedicures together the day before, so all of their toes were cute. A knock on the door brought Griselda in, and she had tears in her eyes. I feel like you've grown up so fast, she said, looking at Joy. I know. In just a week, I've grown enough to marry, Joy said, deciding not to say anything about the strange way Pops and Griselda were talking to her as if they'd known her since she was a small child. Joy was the tallest of the three, but also the slimmest. She always felt as if she had a boy body, but Jim didn't seem to mind at all. Griselda shook her head. It's so amazing. It's about time to start. I have Jim, Ted, and Bob all standing at the front of the church. I'm about to go start the music. Are you three ready? Tessa nodded. We are. Jamie will go first, then me, and then Joy. Good. I'll be at the piano in a minute. Joy waited until Griselda was gone. I want to thank both of you for agreeing to stand up with me. I really appreciate it. Tessa teared up. You know there's nowhere else I would be on your wedding day. No more words were needed. Joy knew how strong her bond was with Tessa. Jamie sniffled. 
I've only known you a short while, but I consider both of you close friends. Thanks for including me. No more tears. Joy said. Let's get out there and do this. They lined up and waited for their turns to walk down the aisle. When the other two were finished, Joy took Pop's arm, and the two of them walked calmly up the aisle. Joy felt Jim's gaze on her and her eyes met his across the expanse. He was everything she'd ever dreamed of, and she was actually going to marry him. He was her forever, whether he knew it yet or not. Her heart fluttered, but there was no doubt in her mind she was doing the right thing. Marrying Jim was the only way to true happiness. He was the other half of her. When she reached the front of the church, Pastor Dinkelheimler smiled at her, and she just then realized she had no idea if the pews were filled or empty. She'd only had eyes for her Jim. It didn't matter, though. As long as he was there beside her, she was happy. The pastor cleared his throat and started speaking, his Bible resting on the pulpit. Dearly beloved, we're here to join this woman, Joy Nelson, in holy matrimony with Jim Cauldron. As he said Jim's name, he licked his fingers and raised them to the sky. The pastor gave Jamie a half-frightened look and started speaking faster, as if he was afraid she'd interrupt and do something. Joy had to wonder if there was video of Jamie's wedding. If there was, she definitely wanted to see it. The wedding was over much faster than she'd expected and when she was pronounced Jim's wife, she stepped toward him and went into his arms, lifting her lips for his kiss. Jim, being the jokester he was, dipped her over his arm and kissed her passionately. Joy had to giggle. She'd never expected to meet a man who could make her heart beat faster, make her laugh, and carry on intelligent conversations all at once. She'd certainly hit the jackpot with him. As they turned around and faced the back of the church, Joy realized there were only a few people there, which thrilled her. The big celebration would be in September. They all went into the fellowship hall and had wedding cake. When it was cut, she was careful not to shove the bite she fed him into his face. She thought that was rude, tacky, and ridiculous. Why would anyone do that to someone they planned to spend their life with? It certainly didn't show love. They spent a total of 20 minutes having cake as a family, and then they all went their separate ways. As she got into his truck with him, she sighed with relief. I'm glad that part of the day is over. Even though it was just family, I still felt like I was being watched by everyone. Now I can just be me. Definitely. Jim nodded toward the back of the truck. I checked on Moonbeam this morning so I have most of the rest of the day free. I packed a picnic lunch, and I figured we'd drive up as far as we could into the mountains to eat it. Joy frowned. I'm in a wedding dress. She reached for the bag she had on the floor, which had a pair of shorts and t-shirt in it. Now you be a gentleman and stare straight ahead, and as soon as we're out of town, I'm changing. But I like you just how you are. Jim said. You know exactly what I mean. I'm not dressed for a picnic, but I will be. Joy had changed clothes in cars more times than she could count. Doing it again now wouldn't hurt her one little bit. She waited until they were in the country and headed for the picnic spot he'd chosen, and she undid her seatbelt, shimmying her skirt up and putting the shorts on. Then she unfasted the dress and pulled the t-shirt over her head pulling the bodice down after she was covered by the fabric of her shirt. There. Now I'm dressed for a picnic. Pushing the dress down over her waist and off her feet, she carefully folded it and set it aside. You never know, when Ted marries, his lady friend might need a dress as well. Jim shook his head. You're silly, you know. Maybe, but I'm not going to a picnic in a wedding dress. That's all I ask of life. Chapter 8 Jim stopped at the top of the mountain and turned to her. I am so annoyed I missed your quick change there. Next time, you're going to have to let me watch. Joy smiled. Maybe. We'll see. She realized she didn't have shoes on, and she'd have to watch where she walked. 
Her shoes were all back at the house, but that should be fine. He shook his head at her, grabbing a cooler from the back seat of his truck. Let's have a picnic, my lady. She smiled, excited that they finally had some time totally alone. A whole day together was more than she could have hoped for. Joy spread out the blanket while Jim held the cooler above it. What's in there? I just fixed a few things this morning that I thought we might both enjoy. And I talked Tessa into slipping me some lemonade. He shook his head. I'm going to have to ask her to teach me to make it. You are the best husband in the whole wide world, and if you don't get on this blanket and kiss me in the next thirty seconds, I may never speak to you again. Jim laughed setting the cooler down and kneeling in front of her. He cupped her face in his hands and looked deeply into her eyes. I don't think you have any idea how much joy you bring to my life. She balled up her hands in his shirt and pulled him to her, her eager lips pressing against his. I love that you changed before we left the church. I seem to remember you just wore a dress shirt to Bob's wedding because you refused to be in a monkey suit. That's very true. Jim moved his hands over her back, stroking her through the thin fabric of her t-shirt. You have no idea how long I've wanted to get my hands on you. One of his hands moved around to cup her breast, and she heard a truck horn blare at them. She jerked back, and Jim groaned. I don't think this is the time or place for us to consummate our marriage, but I want it to be soon. Very soon. It was going to kill him to find ways to fill the day, knowing that she was legally his. By nightfall, he was sure he was going to die from sexual frustration. We could have done a picnic on your living room floor. And missed this view? He raised his arm, pointing to the view of the valley below them. The view is incredible, she agreed, staring into his face. Jim shook his head. You're not looking at it. Oh, but I am. I really am. He chuckled, a bit embarrassed. No woman had ever made it clear that she thought he was sexy before, and he liked it. A lot. Joy opened the cooler and started digging through it. Crackers, cheese, and ham. I like those choices. She pulled out the jar of lemonade and poured them each a glass. What else is in there? she asked as she sipped at her drink. Just a few treats. I talked to Tessa, and she told me your favorite dessert is lemon mousse, so I whipped some up last night. Just whipped it up, huh? You're certainly a man of many talents. She had a feeling she'd be learning more about those talents in a very short while. She pulled out the cheese, crackers, and ham, making herself a small sandwich. Bringing it to her lips, she changed her mind at the last moment, and fed it to him instead. I need grapes to feed you. You could act like a mighty warrior, and I could feed you grapes. It would amuse her a great deal. He laughed, shaking his head. Not a great idea. Why not? Because Starlight told me, I just need to bite you on the butt to get things started. He watched her face as he told her about the horse's ideas. She choked on the cracker in her mouth. The horse you were getting ready for a girl with CP? The very same. She told me she could tell I wanted to mate with you, and I should bite you on the butt. And when I told her that's not how humans mated, she asked if she could watch. I told her no, and you're welcome. Joy laughed loudly. And when did this conversation take place? She couldn't imagine Jim trying to have that conversation with a horse. The day you got here. I introduced you to her, and after you left, she said all that to me. I was both amused and horrified all at once. Sounds like some of your conversations with the horses get really interesting. Oh, they do. Trust me. Jim took a drink of his lemonade. I really wish I could have talked to Moonbeam's foals. It was such a good idea, and it just didn't work. I tried so hard, and I feel like I let the others down. None of them can talk to horses. They should be thrilled that you were willing to do as they suggested and even try. I'm sure Moonbeam felt loved when you did it. 
She did. She always tells me I'm her favorite human, but she loves Cade almost as much. Why does she love Cade so much? Joy thought Jim's cousin seemed nice enough, but what about him made him second only to Jim? He's the one who mixes special feed for her to keep her healthy. He actually even sells feed nationwide. He's great with his mixtures. He has been working constantly on the perfect feed for a pregnant mare, hoping we could keep her healthy with the right foods. I didn't know that. I guess I knew all six of you contributed to the ranch with your work, but I didn't know that was his thing. Yup. If you find him digging through poop and sniffing it, just ignore him. He's weird like that. Well, if it's how he knows that the horses are healthy, then it sounds like it's what he needs to do. Enough talk about my brothers and cousins. Let's talk about us. What should we say about us? Jim frowned. I have a very important question to ask you. Are you ready? She nodded. Yes, I'm ready. Which side of the bed do you like to sleep on? Joy gave him a very serious look. I prefer the middle. Good, cause that's where I'll be. She felt a shiver run through her as she thought about the night ahead of them. Sounds like it could be interesting. Oh, I promise, it'll be interesting. He reached for her and ran a finger along her hand, and she felt her heart start to race. What else do you have planned for our day? she asked. Her preference would be to head to his house and go to bed, but she had a feeling that wouldn't happen immediately. He shrugged. We probably need to move your things from the big house to our house. I've already checked on Moonbeam today, but I'd like to do it once more, but we can just take a long walk. Joy nodded. That sounds good. I have no idea how long it will take to get the rest of my things, and I won't have a car until they arrive. That shouldn't be a problem. Between Tessa and I, we can get you where you need to be. Would she mind if you borrowed her car? You're welcome to drive my truck, but it's a standard. She won't mind at all. And my first car was a standard. No problem there. He grinned. So few people can drive a standard now. Joy nodded. My dad insisted. He told me that I need to be able to drive anything, and he found me an old beat-up Volkswagen bug. I drove it all through college. But the first car you bought for yourself was an automatic. Jim asked. People who liked standards usually only drove standards. Well, I had never really driven an automatic except in driver's ed, so I thought I'd try it and see which I preferred. I wish I'd gotten a standard now, but I will when I get a new car. At least you'll be able to drive my truck until your car arrives. I rarely leave the ranch during weekdays, so just plan to take it if you need it. I leave the keys hanging on a hook beside the front door. I'll do that then. I don't see needing to go anywhere but get groceries, oh, wait. There's a girl I'm supposed to start counseling next week. I'm supposed to talk to Tessa about her. Shouldn't be a big deal. After they'd finished their picnic, Jim took Joy over to the edge of the precipice. From there, she could see the entire valley. This isn't our property, he told her, but it's got a good view of it. Look there. He pointed east, and she could make out the big house and the stable. It's beautiful. Do you have any aerial photos of the ranch? He nodded. We have some from every decade since 1920. It's really cool to compare them. I'd love to do that sometime. Joy rubbed the back of her neck. And I really want to see Yellowstone. Can we go after Moonbeam has the foals? If the foals are healthy, absolutely. If they're not, or if one or both die, Moonbeam will need me, and then we can go in the spring. He walked back to the picnic and started cleaning up their mess, and she joined him. Can you really go in September? Won't you have school? I could take a long weekend. Take a Friday off and leave Thursday night. I'd need to be back in time for school on Monday. A long weekend like that would be wonderful with him. 
she couldn't wait to see Yellowstone. I think we could do that. It's not too far. Only about a three-hour drive. We couldn't see everything, but we could see a lot. I'd really like that. Maybe for spring break, we could do the Grand Tetons? I'm so excited to explore this part of the country. He nodded. I'd love to show it to you. I've never been to the Tetons. Pops and Grams took us to Yellowstone a few times, but never the Tetons. It was quite a bit further to drive there. Makes sense. I can't imagine a car trip with six boys, all the same age anyway. We were angels. That's not how Pops tells it. He said he couldn't keep you in your clothes when you were little because you didn't like anything tied around your tallywhacker. She'd been amused by the story, but she expected him to be embarrassed when she related it to him. Jim grinned. Don't worry. That's changed over the years. Joy blushed deeply, understanding him completely. He definitely turned the embarrassment around. Glad to hear it. She packed the last of their remains into the cooler and folded the blanket, looking around carefully. I think we've gotten everything. I even grabbed someone else's, can they throw away? Good. I hate seeing trash lying around. Our state is so beautiful, and we need to keep it that way. Of course, we do. I was a Girl Scout, and I can still hear my leader say we need to leave things better than we found them, and that's what I always try to do. Joy had absolutely loved being a Scout. It would be nice if she could be a leader of a troop here. I do too. But I wasn't a Girl Scout. Probably for the best. He drove them straight to the big house, where she grabbed the two suitcases, she'd been able to fit into Tessa's tightly packed car. He took them from her and carried them out to his truck, while she hugged Pops and thanked him. You're the only grandfather I've ever known, and I really appreciate how wonderful you've been during my stay. She stood on tiptoe and kissed his cheek. Thank you. I'll see you Sunday if not before. I'll be here to talk to any time you need something. Love you, girl. She waved to Griselda as she left, knowing she'd said what she needed to say to the older woman the night before. Besides, she'd be seeing her again on Sunday anyway. Family dinner. She was excited to be part of the tradition. She joined Jim in the truck, and he drove the short distance to his house. The houses on the ranch seemed well spread out to her. She was glad there would be no one living super close to them. He opened her door for her, and she smiled. You know, I do have the ability to open my own door, but I appreciate the manners. Jim scooped her off the seat and carried her into the house. I'll go back for the suitcases, but this is what you're supposed to do when you first marry. I'm carrying you over the threshold. Joy laughed. I never expected you to actually do that. She loved it though. She felt small as a child in his arms. He shrugged. I figured it would seem romantic, and that's what I'm going for today. Romantic. Did it work? Joy nodded. And since I have no shoes on, you saved my feet. He laughed, shaking his head. All right. I'll bring your suitcases in, but then you need to put shoes on so we can go see Moonbeam. After that, our day belongs to us. She kissed him quickly, before he set her on her feet. I think marriage to Jim Cauldron is going to be very interesting. Are you taking my name? Tessa is still debating whether or not she wants to be a cauldron. Joy shook her head. Tessa is a great deal more feminist than I am. I'll take your name with no problem. I already feel good about it. Even though it means all the kids will lick their fingers when they see you? Even though. I'm not a triplet though, so will they have to for me? You're married to a triplet. I'm sure there's a superstition there too. We live in a very superstitious community. I can see that. And your superstitions are weird here. Joy was still trying to wrap her head around half of them. Jim shook his head. 
No, they're normal here. Other superstitions are weird here. Back in a minute. Joy thought about what he'd said while he was gone, and she decided he was right. Normal superstitions were weird in Cauldron Valley. Jim carried the suitcases up the stairs, and she followed, surprised at how neat the house was. How do you keep from tracking mud in here? The carpet is pristine. My mother designed this house, and she knew Dad would always be dirty after work, so she made a mud room, complete with shower, and that's where I come in. I shower before I leave the mud room. Grams told me that's what Mom was thinking when she helped me move in here. You must really miss your Grams. He nodded. I do. More than anything. She was always my biggest cheerleader. You should have seen her at football games when all six of us were playing. She'd be standing on the bleachers yelling louder than anyone. He could still see her with her fist in the air when one of them made a good play. Joy smiled at the picture he painted. I wish I could meet her. I really wish you could too. He put her suitcases on the bed. Looks like Griselda came after the wedding. The bed is made. I'm opposed to making beds, because I'm just going to mess them up when I sleep in them again anyway. Very true, but I'll probably make the bed in the mornings if you don't mind. I like to see it looking all neat and tidy when I pull back the covers and climb in again. Jim shrugged. If you feel the need, you can go for it. Don't expect me to do it though. I won't. Joy opened one of her suitcases. Do you mind if I unpack before we see Moonbeam? Not at all. You need to find shoes anyway. He sat down in a chair. There are three other bedrooms up here, each with its own bathroom. You're welcome to do anything you want with them. I just kept them as bedrooms, and I let friends stay when we do the rodeo, in September. Should we do our reception the same weekend as the rodeo? So people don't have to come twice? Jim thought about it, and he finally nodded. Should work. It'll just be an extra party one night, and who can complain about a party? Joy smiled. Sounds good to me. I'll call mom back with the date after you give it to me. She finished putting everything away. I'm going to poke into the other rooms for a second. Just want to see what's here. Jim nodded, standing and going with her. This room was mine when we lived here, he said as she looked in a room across the hall. I still remember falling asleep in here. I know that's weird, but it's one of the few memories I have of this house. My mom tucking me in at bedtime and me falling asleep. I need to see pictures of your parents sometime. It would be interesting to see who you look like. Jim shrugged. Mostly, I just look like me. I think a lot of my looks come from Pops, but I'm a meld of everyone. And I'm the only blonde in the family. We're not sure where that came from. If you were a woman, I'd say from a bottle. Jim laughed, shaking his head. Definitely not from a bottle. When she was finished looking in the other bedrooms, she took his hand. Let's go check on Moonbeam. Can I take her a carrot? Not today. I'll ask Kate if it's okay later, but right now, she's on a super balanced diet, and he records every bite she eats. I don't think it would be a good idea without checking with him. Jim shrugged. I'm just being ultra careful about everything concerning her. Joy nodded. Makes sense. You want perfect foals, so you want to make sure you keep her on just the right foods. Thanks for understanding. As they walked toward the stable, he talked to her about everything they'd done since they'd found out Moonbeam was having twins. It's really rare and dangerous for a horse to be carrying twins, but there's something in the water here at the ranch that makes multiples. Or that's how it seems to me anyway. I hope all three make it. Me too. Chapter 9 After his chat with Moonbeam, Jim grabbed one of the four-wheelers they used for getting around the ranch and hopped on. Joy got on behind him, happy to wrap her arms around his waist and ride around the ranch with him, but he didn't ride around. He rode up. 
he took her to an overlook over the ranch. I love there are so many places to just look at the view here, she said, staring around her in awe. I can see our house. This is the best place to see the entire ranch, he told her. When I'm feeling down or upset about something, I come up here and just look at the world around me. She stood beside him, resting her head on his shoulder. This was just the idyllic beginning to their marriage she needed. Thanks for bringing me here. Jim nodded. I've been trying to think of things to do and places to show you today. It's that or take you home and rip your clothes off, and I'm not sure you're ready for that so early in the day. She laughed. Of course, I'm ready for it. I married you, didn't I? Was that what he was waiting for? She'd been ready since they'd said, I do. He looked at her for a moment, as if trying to ascertain if she was serious. When he realized she was, he let out a whoop. Get your sweet butt back on that four-wheeler then. You get to go back to my house. Our house, she corrected, softly. He grabbed her and kissed her. I like the way you think. Getting on the four-wheeler, he drove back to his house much faster than he knew he should have. He could hear pops in his ear telling him to take it slow, but he couldn't. And he broke one of the cardinal rules of the ranch. Always return four-wheelers to the stables. He didn't care. Jim was intent on one thing and one thing only. He drove straight to his house and got off the four-wheeler, leaving the key in the ignition as they always did. He took Joy's hand and tugged her toward the house. Do you need a snack or water? he asked. I'm not sure I plan to come up for food anytime soon. She laughed. Let me grab water for both of us then. We don't want to risk dehydration. You go upstairs. I'll get the water. I know where the glasses are, and I'll be faster. Joy couldn't believe how eager he was when he'd seemed positively lackadaisical just twenty minutes before. She hurried to their room and grabbed the little nightgown she'd purchased on her girl trip to Helena the day before. Going into the bathroom, she threw off her clothes and let them lay where they fell, which was not something she usually did with her neat nature. She pulled the nightgown over her head, knowing he wouldn't let her wear it long, but she felt sexy in it, and with her lack of curves, that wasn't terribly easy to do. When she opened the door, Jim was just walking into the room, and he put a glass of water onto each nightstand. She stood in the doorway of the bathroom, wishing she knew how to strike a sexy pose, but the truth was, she had no earthly idea. Jim turned from the second nightstand and saw her standing there in her light blue silky nightie. He stared for a moment, trying not to swallow his tongue. You look amazing. And you look overdressed. Maybe I can help you with that. She tried to sound confident about what she was doing, but the truth was she had no clue. She'd never done this before, and she had no clue how to be sexy or sultry or any of those things. She just knew she wanted to be with him. Jim grinned at her, pulling his tucked shirt out of the waistband of his jeans. I'd love for you to help me. I like that thing you're wearing. She laughed. A little something I picked up in Helena yesterday. Well, it's amazing, and you should wear it every day but only around me. My brothers and cousins would lose their minds if they saw you that way. Joy smiled, her hands going to the buttons on his shirt. Let's get you as naked as I feel. He laughed. Well, I wouldn't mind if you were more naked. I'm not sure I'm quite ready for that at the moment. I'll wear this a little longer. Probably a good call. I might go too fast if you take it off. His hand stroked over her shoulders as she unbuttoned every button on his shirt. She pushed it off his shoulders, and he had to stop touching her for a moment, which disturbed him deeply. She looked down at his boots and frowned. I'm not sure I can take those off you. I'm sure you can't, without landing on your butt. I'll just remove them. He towed off each boot, and then unbuttoned his jeans, dropping them onto the floor. He stood in just his boxer briefs for a moment, 
before he pulled her to him and looked deeply into her eyes. I hope you know how desirable I find you. She nodded. It's kind of obvious with a guy. Nice of you to notice. I try. He pushed her down onto the foot of the bed and sat beside her, his mouth on hers and his hands stroking over her shoulders, arms, and back. Finally, his hand came around to her front and cupped her breast, and she arched into his hand. She'd always thought her breasts were too small to make any man happy, but Jim wasn't complaining. Not one little bit. You're perfect, he whispered, and Joy let out a sigh. I was so worried you wouldn't be interested anymore when you saw I look like a boy under my clothes. He laughed. You look nothing like a boy. Nothing at all. He pushed her back onto the bed and kissed a trail from her neck down to her breast, taking the peek in his mouth through the fabric of her nightgown. I think it's time to get rid of this thing. She plucked at the sides of her nightgown. He sat up, pulling her up as well and removing the offending garment. There. Now you're just like I wanted you. She shook her head, blushing. Just kiss me. It didn't take long before he covered her with his body, slowly sliding into her. It felt so strange to her. Not bad, but strange. He lay still atop her for a moment as he waited for her to get used to him. When she started wiggling, he knew it was all right for him to move again, and he covered her mouth with his as he began the ancient dance that took them both to fulfillment. Afterward, Joy lay with her head on his shoulder, breathless. She didn't feel like she could get close enough to him, and she sighed, contentedly. Thanks for not making me wait until bedtime, Jim said. It would have killed me. She laughed. Your pants were too tight for your tallywhacker again? You're not ever allowed to talk to Pops again. Asterisk. Jim had to return to work on Wednesday, and it wasn't until after he was gone that she realized he still hadn't told her about his dyslexia. Did he not trust her to know about it? She spent all day with Tessa, and Tessa filled her in on Abby and what the little girl had told her when she started speaking again. I don't think I'm supposed to start working with her until next week, Joy said, but I wish I could start with her now. It feels odd to just make her wait. I've been visiting her at least three times a week, and we talk a lot. I'm not you, but I've been doing my best to channel you. I don't even want to think about that, Joy said, shaking her head. You're probably being all weird and talking about Pavlov's dog. Tessa had once told her that the only thing that mattered in psychology was Pavlov and the experiment he'd done with dogs to make them salivate whenever a bell was rung. I didn't bring up that experiment even once. Tessa protested. Joy went home before supper time, determined to cook a special meal for Jim, but she found him there, already in the kitchen. I was going to cook. Jim smiled. I know, but you hate it, and I love it. So, I came home early. The guys don't mind if I take half days all week as long as I make sure Moonbeam is all right. Were you able to talk to the foals today? She asked. She leaned on the counter to watch him cook. He looked good with a wooden spoon in his hand. No, but we're going to keep trying. Moonbeam was in good spirits today. I told her you're my forever mate now, and she really likes you. I walked her around as well. We haven't let anyone ride her since we found out it was twins, so she hasn't been getting as much exercise. We need to be more careful to walk her as much as possible. Maybe I could do that, Joy suggested. It would give me something to do until school starts. What would you be doing with your summer if you were still in Illinois? he asked, stirring the rice in the skillet. He'd just added a couple of eggs, and he'd already put some cooked chicken and stir-fry veggies in. I'd be reading books and spending time with Tessa. We usually took a road trip together every summer. Feel free to read books. Spend time with Tessa. I'm not so sure about a road trip, but you two can hang out and have fun if you want. He didn't like the idea of her leaving for a road trip. He wanted her there. 
Yeah, I don't want to take a road trip, but maybe Tessa and I, and Jamie if she wants to join us, can explore the area. How long has the ranch been in your family? She asked. Since the 1850s. My ancestors went on the Oregon Trail and staked their claim for this ranch. Well, not all of it. They got the initial 640 acres with their land grant, and then they slowly bought up more land around them. Pops has a journal somewhere about the family's trip here. Oh, that's fascinating. Would he mind if I read it? I think he'd be thrilled. His only granddaughter taking interest in the history of the family. Sounds like a dream come true for Pops, don't you think? Joy grinned. I'm going to set the table. Looks like supper is close to done. She had to help him out since he'd been kind enough to cook for her. Having a husband was even better than she'd thought it would be. Sounds good. And remember you promised to be on dish duty. I haven't forgotten. You cook, and I clean. Perfect arrangement as far as I'm concerned. After supper, he suggested a walk, and she was all for it. She loved walking in the cool summer evenings with him. The ranch was so big. She knew she hadn't been on even a fraction of it yet, so she was thrilled that he wanted to walk often. Did you spend the day with Tessa? he asked. Joy nodded. Yeah. We talked about that little girl I need to work with. I hate the idea of waiting until next week. She sounds like she needs me now, but I don't feel like I can press ahead until I've been given the okay. He smiled. You sound like me. If I know there's a job to be done, I want to get on it right away. Me too. She shook her head. Little Abby is going to need some serious counseling but hopefully we can get her through most of it before school starts. Joy's heart ached for the little girl who had watched her parents get murdered and still blamed herself for it. She was now a foster child of one of the neighbors. At least you'll stay busy. I'm not one of those people who gets bored. I'll do a deep clean of the house, read some books, hang out with Tessa, maybe start a new craft. You don't have to worry about me. She could easily keep herself occupied, though she would rather be with Jim. Jim shook his head. Sounds like I might need to just stay out of your way. She laughed. No, I don't think so. I'd so much rather have you beside me. Chapter 10 On Friday afternoon, Joy went to the stable, to be there when Starlight left for her new home. As she walked in, Jim was there, his hands on either side of her face and he was talking soothingly to her. I promise, you're going to love Lisa and your new home. I will visit when I can. He chuckled. Yes, I'm doing much better now that I've been with my mate for a while. Joy shook her head, knowing immediately what Jim was talking about. She walked over to him and smiled at Starlight. Jim is a good mate. Starlight whinnied. I don't think I even want to know what she's saying. No, you probably don't. Jim looked behind him. Lisa is here. You remember Lisa. The little girl walked in with crutches, and she stood beside the stall where Starlight was. My dad said I could ride her before we take her home. Did you make me a saddle? Jim shook his head. No, I didn't make a saddle for you, but my cousin, Deck did. Deck walked over, and Jim introduced him to the girl. Deck smiled. I did my best to make a saddle that you could stay in better. I think this one will be just what you need. Lisa smiled. Can I try it now? Of course. Jim was surprised how good Deck was with the little girl, but he remembered Deck had said he wanted kids. From the gentle way he helped the little girl into the saddle, showing her how to place her legs and where to shift her weight, it was clear he was a natural with children. Who would have thought this big burly cousin of Jim's could be so gentle? It took less than an hour for Lisa to try out the saddle and for them to get Starlight loaded up. Jim shook hands with Lisa's father. Remember, if you have any trouble at all, just give me a call. 
I'm happy to come over and do a little more training so you get exactly what you need from Starlight. I'm not afraid to call. Thank you so much for making this a special experience for Lisa. Lisa's a special girl and she needs special experiences. When she gets good with that horse, she'll need to ride it out to start the rodeo. Maybe next year. The girl's father laughed. You know, with that as incentive, she's going to work really hard to get better fast. Jim smiled. Starlight will enjoy that. Thanks again. With that, he walked to the van he'd already helped Lisa back into, and another man drove away with Starlight. Jim put his arm around Joy as he watched the two vehicles leave. I'm going to miss that horse. I'm sure she's going to miss you too. Joy was thrilled he did something he loved so much and that he was so good at. It had been fun to watch him send Starlight on. Asterisk. They'd been married a week when Jim decided he had to tell Joy about his dyslexia. He was surprised she hadn't figured it out in a week of being together almost all the time, but he was glad she hadn't. He just hoped she would still care for him when she found out about his dark secret. He picked a bouquet of wildflowers on his way home from work, planning to make a chicken salad for supper that would knock her socks off. Well, probably not, because she almost never had anything on her feet, but that was neither here nor there. He would tell her everything while she ate, and then he'd give her the option of staying or going. He knew he should have told her before the wedding, but he hadn't been able to trust that she would stay. How could he? He didn't know any other 30-year-old men who couldn't read. When he got home, he saw that she was already at the stove. He took a deep sniff and smiled. What is that? It's called dirty rice. Tessa and I had a sweetmate from Louisiana, and she made it all the time. I'm kind of addicted. I could eat it every night and never get enough. Joy turned to him and smiled, noting the bouquet of flowers in his hand. Are those for me? Jim nodded, taking them to her and kissing her softly. I was going to make chicken salad, he said. Well, you can make chicken salad tomorrow. I needed dirty rice tonight. I'll probably make it at least every other week for as long as I live. I just can't stop eating this stuff. He laughed, noting she was making a huge pot full. You planning to eat it for lunches for a week or two? Yes. Exactly. And you can have some too, if you don't take too much. She took a vase down from one of the cabinets and filled it with the flowers. Would you put these in the middle of the table for me? Then I can look at them while we eat. Does this mean I have to do the dishes tonight? He asked. Nah, I'll still do the dishes. It's not your fault I was craving dirty rice. She dished up two bowls of the hearty meal and carried them to the table. I stole some lemonade from Tessa too. Well, I gave her the stuff to make it and told her it was mine, and I brought it home after she did. Jim shook his head. She would probably teach you to make it if you asked her. Joy nodded. She's offered dozens of times, but I want her to make it. Of course. He sat down at the table with her and picked up his fork. This smells delicious. I might have to ask you to make it more often. Don't think I wouldn't. I'll even teach you to make it. Joy hoped he liked it just as much as she did. If he didn't, she might have to not make it as often, and that would be a tragedy. He took a bite, and the flavors exploded on his tongue. What seasoning did you put in here? It's this Creole seasoning blend my friend showed me. She said to never get another brand. Just this one. Well, I sure approve whatever it is. He ate a few more bites, before setting his fork down. He'd put off this conversation for long enough. I need to talk to you about something. Is Moonbeam all right? Joy asked, her eyes going wide. It was the only thing she could imagine that would make Jim look so serious. He smiled. Moonbeam is fine. I. I should have told you something before we ever married, but I didn't have the guts, 
and now I feel like it's been too long, and you're going to hate me forever. This was even harder for him than he'd imagined it would be. She seemed happy with him, but would she still be when she realized what was wrong with him? She felt her heart flutter. Finally, he'd tell her, and she could quit pretending she didn't know. It had been hard not leaving him notes or texting him. I could never hate you. She set her fork down as well, because she knew this was serious to him. Though her eyes kept being drawn back to the rice. She really didn't want to stop eating it. He decided to start at the beginning, which was when he'd gone to school. I started school when I was five, just like my brothers and cousins. But we learned early on that they were all a lot smarter than I was. They were all reading short picture books by the time we got out of kindergarten, and I could barely read my own name. In fact, my name is one of the few things I can read even now. I'm dyslexic, and I had teachers work with me with all kinds of different methods, and I went to special schools at times. I just could never learn to read. Joy nodded. That had to be really frustrating for you. She found herself immediately going into counselor mode, though it wasn't intentional. He frowned at her. You're not upset? I'm upset that you had such a hard time in school, and that you feel like this will be a big deal to me. She shook her head. But it doesn't bother me, you can't read. You're a very intelligent man, and I can tell you've worked hard to educate yourself in a lot of different ways. He blinked a few times. You're not going to leave me? Never. Did you really think I'd leave you because you had a learning disability? Well, I wasn't sure. People in school made fun of me. Joy took a deep breath. Kids can be really cruel, especially when someone has a hard time doing what is easy for everyone else. But you're a functioning adult with a wonderful job, and not being able to read hasn't prevented you from becoming everything you wanted to be. So why would it bother me? Jim shook his head. I just figured you'd think I was stupid and not want to be with a man who barely graduated from high school. You have a master's degree. I do. And I learned how to help people with dyslexia. I never learned how to look down on someone for it. Joy was thrilled his grandfather had told her about his dyslexia, so she could handle it so calmly. Not that she would have been negative about it, but being prepared always helped. Besides, I could never look down on the man I love for something out of his control. Jim stared at her for a minute. You really love me? She laughed. Of course, I do. I wouldn't have married you otherwise. After we danced at Tessa's wedding, I went home, but I left my heart here in Montana. I thought about you constantly. It had been hard for her to work with Tessa gone, and her thinking about Jim, but she'd managed. He grinned. I thought of you constantly. In fact, when I was asked what I was looking for in a wife, I said only someone who would bring me joy would do. I hope I do bring you joy, she said softly. Being your wife is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And you're the best thing that has happened to me. I love you, Joy Cauldron. I love you so much, it hurts sometimes. I'm supposed to bring you joy not pain. Keep that in mind. She looked down at her dirty rice. I want to run off to bed with you, but then my rice would go to waste, and, well, that can't happen. He nodded. I totally agree. This is the most amazing thing I've put in my mouth in a long time. He picked his fork back up and shoveled more of the delicious dish into his mouth. She nodded. I'm glad we have our priorities straight. As soon as we finish eating, and I've carefully stored the leftovers, we'll go to bed, and then I'll get up and do the dishes after. He chuckled. My wife is a neat freak. And absolutely obsessed with dirty rice. Don't forget about that. Trust me, I won't. He picked up her hand and kissed the palm of it. You are amazing, and I'm so glad you agreed to be my wife. Thank you for not being angry that I didn't tell you about my dyslexia. She shook her head. It doesn't matter to me at all. 
You just let me know how I can help you. Well, next time you make this, show me how. Just one lesson, and I'll be able to do it forever. Joy grinned at him. Happy to do it. Thinking of the days, weeks, months, and years they would have together filled her with peace. Jim was the man she'd been born to love. Epilogue. Hands in the pockets of his jeans, Decker stood on the ridge looking down at the ranch. This was his favorite spot on his family's land, he loved being able to see so much. When he built his house up here, he vowed to have a big porch looking out over this view, so he could sit here and sip his morning coffee in peace. He'd always loved designing and building things, and this mythical future house of his was no exception. In his mind's eye, he could see the gables and white railing and big front door. Of course, the railing would need to be reinforced to keep the kids safe up here on the deck. It was quite a fall down the... Sheepishly, he felt his lips curl. Kids. Funny how he was already planning for his future children. Haven't even met their mother yet, and you're worried about their safety, huh? With a sigh, Deck kicked at a stone, watching it tumble over the edge of the ridge. The other day, he'd helped his cousin Jim prepare starlight for little Lisa. And Decker had been surprised at the surge of longing which had hit him when he'd lifted the little girl into the saddle. One day, he wanted to teach his daughter how to ride. He wanted to be the one she trusted, the one she smiled at the way Lisa had smiled when he'd taught her what she needed to know about the special saddle he'd made for her. Lisa had a loving family. And one day, he vowed, he would too. Just have to meet my kid's mama first, I guess. Since his cousins and brothers had agreed to get married, all but Wyatt, of course, he'd been looking carefully at each woman he knew in Cauldron Valley. None had shared that spark with him, the thing which told him they would be a good partner. But he'd find her. His smile grew as he looked out over the beautiful Montana evening. She was out there, somewhere, the woman who would be his wife, and mother to his children. He'd find her.